Good afternoon and welcome to Treasures in the Field. I am Randy Hall and with me is Pastor Mike. Thank you for coming out, Pastor Mike. My pleasure. Yeah, and at the airing of this one, we will be celebrating 40 years, huh, Pastor Mike? That's what they tell me. There we go. I didn't have much to do with it, but <laughs> here I am. Hey, you get presents just for being born. That's I, it's awesome, amazing thing. It? Talk about undeserved grace. Exactly. My mom should be getting the presents, actually. I mean, she really gets all the credit. <laughs> That's good. So we had a great time Sunday with the service. I really did enjoy mm -hmm. it. Uh, we just, like we do every week, we're going to go a little deeper and ask some good questions. Uh, so if you would first just give us an overview and then we'll go deeper into the questions. Absolutely. So this past week, we considered the end of John 11, the beginning of John 12, following the raising of Lazarus from the dead and two very different responses to it. At the end of chapter 11, we see the religious leaders plotting Jesus' death. His signs were undeniable. And they knew that the more he was uh, performing these wonderful signs, the more of a following he would draw. And they had to be rid of him in order to preserve their power and, and try to stop the, the Roman army from sensing an uprising and coming in and violently putting it down. And so in their political machinations, this was, this was their response to plot his demise. But in contrast, we see at the beginning of chapter 12, a Mary pouring forth in, in devoted and grateful and humble worship by spilling a, a whole pound of perfume over the Lord and uh, preparing his body beforehand for burial and a wonderful exemplary act of worship. And that's the right kind of response to Jesus' goodness. Oh, yeah. That was it's a powerful message. It was a good one. Um, so one of the first things I noticed at the beginning is something that, I, that really just spoke to me because I hear it when you talk to people about they have faith. Mm. And, and then you want to go a little deeper. Mm -hmm. And so I think one of your first major points was uh, that faith has to have an object. Mm -hmm. Could you expound a little bit on that? Oh, of course, I'd be happy to. And I think it is important in our pluralistic age, right? Mm -hmm. Where I think a lot of people do have respect for spirituality and various religions, as, as long as it's helping them to be a good person. It's a good thing that they believe in something. And maybe that does have some pragmatic, uh, pragmatic effects of helping that person live a life that's more respectful to those around them if they feel that they are accountable to some higher power. But in light of eternity, mm -hmm. your faith in anything but Jesus Christ is going to end up with a lot of disappointment in the end and is not going to sustain you into eternity. And, uh, you know, people talk sometimes about the, uh, the Oprah type of religion, mm -hmm. right? And I'm not picking on Oprah specifically, but I think she represents what a lot of popular celebrities will teach of as long as you believe in something, yeah. Uh, that that's a good thing. So the important thing is just believe. You'll hear it in songs and lame holiday specials. You know, if you just believe, mm -hmm. but the, the, the phrase ends there. And it's, and it's not enough to just believe because in almost every case, you're going to be believing in something that lets you down. The object of your faith is what matters. In fact, the Bible itself often rebukes a faith in the wrong thing. I think about Jeremiah 17, 5, thus says the Lord, cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength. Blessed is the man who trusts the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. And so scripture itself rebukes a faith that is in the wrong object, but of course blesses a faith that is in the right object in the Lord in Jesus Christ. And so uh, it's very important for us in a pluralistic age to really emphasize not the value of faith in and of itself, but faith in the right object. Yeah, and I think that's very helpful, even for saved individuals, because mm. uh, I think they sometimes get intimidated and says, well, this person has faith and it doesn't matter that they have quote unquote faith mm -hmm. if it's not in the true God of the Bible. That's right. That's so right. That was just a great point starting off that I thought was awesome. Well, to give another brief example, um, I know with Alcoholics Anonymous, yeah. right? And, and it's a program that probably practically has helped a lot of people. But one of the, one of the main points is faith in a higher power. Mm -hmm. And you know, that's not enough, <laughs> not for our eternity. Uh, it has to be the higher power, the one that has revealed himself through his word. And, and that's God. And uh, as we know him, the, 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 the triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit, that's the specific higher power that we must believe in, not just, not just any old God. Yeah. When you mentioned alcohol, Donald, the sad part is that it started off 
as a Christian endeavor to help men overcome that. Mm. And they watered it down to try to right. appeal to non-believers. Right. And this is what happens when you talk about general faith mm. as opposed to faith in the God of the Bible. That's right. And so, yeah, that's very important. Another one that I, uh, you pointed out as you kept moving through the scriptures is we meet uh, Caiaphas. Mm -hmm. And he's this uh, political mover and shaker mm -hmm. and, and just does things for political reasons. And it reminds me of just our current day, yeah. <laughs> especially in this political climate. And so my question is, how can we ensure that we don't look like the Sanhedrin and allow, I don't know, political pressure to cause us to, to buckle mm -hmm. upon doing what we know we should do as Christians? Yeah. Yeah. Well, politics does matter. Um, at its best, ideally, politics is a way of loving your neighbor for the glory of Christ. And so engagement with politics as Christians should look like that. But it's a very subtle thing when we go from in our politics, using it as a means to glorify Christ, to serve Christ and serve others, and then to, to, to switch over into a mode where we are manipulating Christ for our ends and what we believe may be best for ourselves. In politics, it is, it is great to use it to glorify Christ. It is not great to use it to manipulate Christ. And there is a lot of that in politics in our culture. I mean, you see this with politicians trying to win over the evangelical vote. Mm -hmm. And so they'll talk about their faith and whatever, and they'll pander. Meanwhile, both in their personal lives and even in a lot of their policies, they're not glorifying Christ. They're not submitting to his will. And so we all have to be careful of that, um, even if we're not politicians, even apart from engagement and in politics, it's, it's a very subtle thing when our hearts go from just wanting to glorify and serve Christ to begin to manipulate him for our ends. And this is why it's so important just to know what his will is according to his word so that we can live that out by the help of the Holy Spirit and to not pick and choose from his word to mm -hmm. manipulate his word or who Christ reveals himself to be for our own ends. And, um, and, I, and I think if we are mindful of that, we can avoid some of the pitfalls that men like Caiaphas fell into. Yeah, yeah. I also thinking of on the flip side of like as he's manipulating God, mm -hmm. he's also manipulating other people, the councils. That's right. And causing this fear. That's right. Of of Rome. Mm -hmm. And I was especially thinking of the time that we're in where as Christians, sometimes to be a Christian mm -hmm. is to incur the wrath of our current government that's on a trajectory mm -hmm. against anything Christian like. Right. So how can right. we just be bold even in that aspect so we're not falling victim to someone manipulating mm -hmm. us. Yeah. I think you have to be very wary of someone who encourages your primary political motivation to be your own personal self-preservation and your own personal benefit and gain. Now, government should be a blessing to people. Don't get mm -hmm. me wrong. Government at its best allows for human flourishing. But if that's our primary motivation in politics is some sort of self-preservation and not ultimately for the glory of Christ to be seen in our nation, in our community, in our state, then that's where things can go very badly wrong because we can get real pragmatic when it comes to what we think will preserve us. And that's what Caiaphas did. He yeah. was being purely pragmatic, saying, hey, Rome's going to swoop in. We're going to lose our places. Temple's going to be looted. Nation's going to be overtaken. And that happened anyway yeah. because he was pragmatic rather than submitting to Christ and recognizing the revelation that God was, was bringing in at that moment. And so we've got to be submitted to God's revelation and be very wary of anyone who encourages our primary motivation to be our own personal gain and self-preservation. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's great advice. Great advice. And so moving from the plots to the actual perfume part of it, mm -hmm. I did love that uh, the title. And one day we're going to take a time to figure out how do you come up with these creative titles? <laughs> <laughs> I grew up Baptist, so there was a lot of alliteration in those circles. OK, that's most of it. But we see um, we see just this unabashed breaking of this perfume and mm -hmm. and wiping it with her hair and it's just like this I'm worshiping Christ at all costs mm. and so how are some ways that we as Christians can cultivate that that way to say you know what I don't care what other people think about me mm. this is yeah. what God has called me to do and I'm going to do it with boldness really mm -hmm. 
Yeah. I think that really comes back to living for an audience of one. Fearing the Lord rather than fearing people. Loving the Lord so that we can love people without fearing them, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think we do want to be genuine in our worship of the Lord and pour forth sincerely before him, not in such a way that is isolated. It's not just me and Jesus. Jesus wants me to operate in context of brothers and sisters in a church around me. So there is a way to pour forth in worship before the Lord that would not be a blessing for those around me. And it's okay for me to be mindful of that, Mm -hmm. following the New Testament commands to love others around me and be considerate of them. But that should be a posture of love toward others and not fear of others. And it's when we fear people because we need their approval and we need their applause that could lead us to either a worship that is performative Just to give a very simple example, I'm going to lift my hands because I need the people around me to think that I'm spiritual rather than it being all about God and being grateful to him. Um, Or I don't do that because I don't want people around me to think that I'm getting too emotional because for some reason I just want that to be their evaluation of me. Either of those responses is based upon the fear of man. And so if I fear God, And if I'm living for him, and if I love people around me enough to say, hey, I I just want to truly worship God, and if that's an encouragement to those around me as well, that's great. But it's not out of a fear for their approval one way or another. And so that really does have to be cultivated deep within your heart Mm -hmm. to, to find your security and your affirmation in Christ and Christ alone who you are in Christ, your identity in him, who he has made you and called you to be. If you are secure in that and only fearing God, then you are free to to love those around you, but not to be restricted by their approval or non-approval. And and that is something that can take a while to cultivate, just to be transparent. That's Mm -hmm. been a struggle in my life and something that thankfully the Lord's brought to my attention so that for years, by his grace, I've worked to overcome that fear of man in my heart. And that's really something that that every Christian should make as a priority, truly cultivating a fear of God, not so that you, not so that those around me don't matter, Mm -hmm. but so that I'm free to love them rather than being paralyzed by them. Yeah. That's good stuff. That's good stuff. I think that's very important. Mm-hmm. And um, and lastly, before we go, we'll give you a chance to repent for your hating on onions. <laughs> 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 oh, no, but no, I really yeah. did in, uh, enjoy the service. We are thankful for this time to just mm-hmm. really dive deeper into these things. I think these are uh, great things for us to remember as we're uh, reflecting on all that's going on and just trying to make sure we only... Don't just say, that was a great sermon, Mm. but we take these things and say, you know what, in light of what I just heard, Mm. maybe I need to cultivate this and Mm. I need to work on this and pray for God. So I'm just so thankful for that. Well, I'm looking forward to a glorified body that hopefully does like onions so I can enjoy (laughs) them in a way that so many people around me enjoy them. But uh, thank you very much, Randy. And I'm looking forward to this coming Sunday. Uh, We'll be continuing on in John chapter 12 and very excited about the text before us this week. Jesus' triumphal entry into the city of Jerusalem uh, leading up to Passion Week. And we'll have a lot to, to say about that and to meditate upon. Uh, but then also a verse that I'm, I'm so excited to get to, John 12, verse 20. And I encourage you to look at this verse and meditate upon it ahead of time. Mm-hmm. It has become for me over the years one of the most profound verses in the Bible, uh, where Jesus speaks of the fact that unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. It is a profound, profound statement with all manner of meaning, both for what Jesus was about to endure and for us as followers of Jesus. So I'm really excited to meditate upon that text um, with with you all. And uh, I just want to say I appreciate you, Randy, uh, hosting this podcast, putting in a lot of work into these questions, into the preparation. And I just want to mention as well, for anyone who follows the podcast, um, as you're hearing these sermons on Sunday, what we're trying to do in this podcast is to answer some questions that may arise in your mind as you hear these sermons. We want it to be a help to you. And uh, if if you have a question like that, feel free to approach Randy, recommend a question for us to consider next week. And uh, we truly want this to be a beneficial follow-up and meditation for you. Yep. Yep. 
And if you would be so kind as to pray us out. I'd be happy to. Lord, we uh, thank you for this time and just rejoice in time in your word. It's so powerful and we simply want to receive it from you and to grow in it in every way. And I pray for each and every person who's tuned in this week that you will encourage them in your word this week to walk in humble gratitude before you, to walk in the fear of the Lord and not the fear of man. Uh, Lord, this is the way for us to glorify you with our lives. And so please help us grow according to your word and by the power of your spirit. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And as my friend Pastor John always says, go with God. <laughs>